if there's only two angles or two sides of the triangle, you can't do set off. And that's the reality. Now, circular debt will have massive, massive implications. You know why? There's massive grossing up of your balance sheet. You've got assets, liabilities, assets, liabilities. And you know what makes matters worse? You know, you've got the receivable and you have a liability. The liability is technically payable on demand, isn't it? The receivable is not receivable on demand. You, the reality is, you have, if a receivable is not receivable on demand, what do you have to do? Simple IS-39, you have to discount it. Now, you know what, we, we issued this thing, I mean, selling of electricity, and that is done on a cash basis. The fact that now we have to recognize it at a lower amount means potentially there's an impairment. If somebody hasn't paid you or settled for a very, very long time, what does that mean? A million rupees today is not the same as a million rupees in five years' time. And you have to realize that. There's time value. Your inflation rate is high. So therefore, there must be some impairment if somebody has promised to pay you today and only pays you in five years' time. I'm surprised when people don't book impairment. All right. Let's not get controversial. All right. This one here. Assets fully depreciated in use. This is amazing. I see lots of companies, even auditing firms, have assets that are fully depreciated. For example, we were, we were looking at our computers. We are expected to use our computers for five years, but they depreciated it over three. Why are they doing that? Because they don't want the hassle of the journal entries for depreciation. But what is depreciation? Depreciation is to allocate that asset's value over its useful life. We have a client in Kuwait whose head office building, which they are currently using, is sitting at zero. Doesn't make sense. You haven't applied your mind to depreciation. IS 16 paragraph 71 says an entity shall review at least, at least, at least, that's the minimum, annually, its depreciation rate, its residual value and its depreciation method and should change its accounting policy prospectively. Now, if people were applying that standard, and it's there, it's not anything new. It was there from 2005. It was actually there from before. You have to review your useful life annually. If you were doing that, you would have never got to a situation where you have assets in your business that are sitting at zero or one dirham or, what, or one rupee that are still in use. You know, t people tend to have this problem with computers. Let's just depreciate it over three years. But the reality is the next time they're going to buy computers is in six years' time. How can you depreciate it in three years? Your inspected usage is five or six years. Same thing with furniture and equipment. Goodness gracious, they want to use it for 10 or 12 years. Let's get it off our books over five. So my point here is companies have assets that are in use but are sitting at zero. Now, auditors don't always pick this up because auditors look at the balance. Hey, where's that asset? They don't see, hey, there's an asset. Where's the balance? <laughs> All right. They test the other way. Anyway, that's there. Aggressive structuring. We're seeing a lot of aggressive structuring. What, what are people doing? Even clients come to us and say, okay, we know that this is the accounting. Tell me what can I change in my contract to change the accounting? Oh, I don't want this to be a lease. Oh, I want this to be a finance lease. What must I change? That's upside down. You don't compromise the integrity of a contract for an accounting objective. Who are you fooling? You know, there was, a, I'll tell you, in 2007, there was a person who asked me this question. You know, how do I sort out the sukuk? He wanted to achieve derecognition of property on the sukuk. So he says, please, okay. We can't get the recognition. Tell me how I can do this. I say, take out, the, take out the provision that the property price will fall. So he said, in 2007, this person told me, I promise you in my life, property prices never fell. And this is in 2007. I'd like to see him today. <laughs> anyway, that's the reality. Don't ever set a contract for an um, accounting objective. Do it the other way around. Another issue about new codes. People create holding companies and new codes. I mean, if something is illegal for them to do, they create a new co on top to do it. These things, please don't do that. That's, that's synthetic accounting. 
All right, so what I've done, taken a lot of time to do this, but given you some sense, some flavor of where IFRS is in this world. At this point in time, I maybe can take maybe two or three minutes questions before I move on to my next section. Are there any questions at this point in time? Any thoughts? I, I mean, are you feeling fed up now that IFRS is just becoming too much? I say yes. Hey, hold it a little bit. Give us a chance. Let us catch up. Let us take a breath. I mean, changes in IFRS are not just changes to a book. They change companies. They change systems. These are important things. But anyway, let's continue if there are no questions. My next topic I'm going to be speaking about is an exposure draft on leases. Generally, I don't speak of exposure drafts. But I think this one is imminent. Because it is imminent, I need to speak to you about it. And this one is a game changer. It's going to change the way everybody looks at leases forever. Let me give you context here. You know what, if you look at the financial statements of an airline, guess what you won't find on the financial statements? Guess what you won't find? You'll never find aircraft. You'll never, no airline, maybe Etihad is one or two, because they made, they made a mistake on their leasing. But other than that, no airline in the world has got aircraft on its balance sheet. That, that, does that make sense intuitively? I mean, goodness, if you look at the Emirates flight, or you look at the PIA flight, that thing is so specialized, that seat color, the floor color, the roof, and the Emirates Airlines, you've got the little star roof. It is so specific, yet that asset isn't on the balance sheet. You know why? People like getting things into operating lease. Why? Operating lease is the only way left under IFRS where you can get off balance sheet financing. The reason airlines don't want the aircraft and the balance sheet is not because they don't want the aircraft. They don't want the related liability that comes with it. And the aircraft is theirs. I mean, at the moment in Dubai, there's an air show. Every airline now goes and boasts how many aircraft they're purchasing. But guess what? None of that hits the balance sheet. That's why we need a new leasing standard. Now, why we need a new leasing standard? In reality, lawyers pull the wool over our eyes all the time. They try to either structure something as a finance lease or operating lease. In Saudi Arabia, the structuring is very, very aggressive. Why? Because they're trying to avoid getting assets. Why? Because of zakat. They are structuring to reduce their asset base because they don't want to, they're trying to avoid zakat. Now that's another issue, whether that's an ethical thing or not. But besides the point. People are structuring things between finance lease and operating lease. People are doing funny, fine, funny kind of special purpose vehicles. What does the new standard say? The new standard is going to change this. Let's look at the lessee for a change, just on the lessee side. You no, more gonna, no longer have to make a distinction between a finance lease and an operating lease. What the exposure draft is proposing that when you have an operating, what was historically called an operating lease, you will still have an asset and you will have a corresponding liability for that lease payments. Interesting. There's no more a question of is this a finance lease or operating lease. You are going, if you have an operating lease for five years, you will recognize a right to use asset for five years and you will recognize the liability to make payments for five years. So theoretically, everything seems like a finance lease. Now, does this make sense? Conceptually, technically, yes, and I'll tell you why. I have a building. The building lasts 30 years. I'm leasing to this gentleman in the front. The building for five years. I have the asset on my books. I'm, I have it. I'm going to depreciate it for 30 years. He has now a right to use my building for five years. He recognized that right to use asset. And what he does with that asset afterwards, he amortizes it over five years. He has a liability to pay me lease payments for five years. He present values that liability. The way you measure the asset, you start off with the liability. You measure the liability, and then you will, as he makes payments, the liability is written down. So what's happening is, in essence, every lease becomes a finance lease. Now, 
The first thing that people say to me is, Yusuf, aren't we double 